I'm used to either talking to students or talking to my peers, so this will be kind of a, a different thing. Uh, I'll start off just by talking a little bit about who I am. Um, I'm a project manager at, at Indiana Plumbing. I'm an engineer. Uh, project manager, basically I'm, I'm given a project, you know, a set of, of criteria, objectives, and goals, and I'm supposed to deliver those um, on time and on budget to whoever the client might be for that particular project. Um, I'm also a husband and father of my family there, a uh, little girl. Um, I've spent a lot of volunteer time. My church down on Mallory Street um, with the teenagers there, my wife and I help with the youth ministry. Um, coach soccer and, uh, and then in the industry with the American Water Works Association and Virginia Water Environment <coughs> Association. Um, with, uh, we kind of network together and uh, try, part of what I do is K through 12 outreach uh, for the industry to try to generate interest and things like that. Um, so I grew up locally, so here's my educational journey. I don't know if you know people who have taught or do but I, uh, I started at Mary Atkins, um, went to Riverside Elementary, and Dunbar Irwin Middle School, Newport News, and over to Hines for a year. And I went to Ferguson High School, graduated in 94, one of the, one of the last classes there. Um, I went to uh, Virginia Tech, um, and uh, interestingly, my senior year in high school, I got plugged into uh, the governor's school at New Horizons right down here. Um, and they act, are the ones who actually um, introduced me to Gannett Plumbing, the, the company, because we had to do a project. And uh, you put down what field you might be interested in. I put environmental engineering, and they uh, um, hooked me up with someone there. And so I did a uh, kind of a mentorship there for a project. And when I was done with that, um, they offered me a, a, a paid internship there. And so I just kind of stuck with it uh, through college, and uh, I've been there ever since. So that was um, really cool. And then one thing I'll just just add as part of that is I had no idea what an engineer did. I was always kind of told, oh, you're great at math and science, engineering would be a good field for you, but like, what does that, what does that mean? So actually being able to be in an engineering, an office with an engineer, and see what they did um, really solidified that track for me. So just one thing that, for my story, is just if, you know, if students are interested in find, if we, if we can find ways to, to get them exposure to, you know, what that, Profession or what that field does, like in, in the real world, um, it, it can help uh, help guide along that path. Um, so again, for me, this is a, our, our company. I zoomed in on the Mid Atlantic region here. We're, we're very Mid Atlantic focused, uh, but we have 60 offices worldwide, about 2,000 or so people. Uh, diverse range of services, uh, really civil engineering based, so transportation, um, facilities, water resources, dams. Um, uh, water treatment, um, and then uh, we have a, a firm that does like GIS-based solutions, um, and uh, so you know very very civil engineering focus. But that's that's kind of who we are. Um, what I'm going to focus on is is the water field because that's that's kind of where I uh, work in. So there's really three major elements of the water industry: um, drinking water, um, which is you know getting water from the reservoir or river, um, treating it in the treatment processes, and then getting it to the taps in our homes. A lot of things that we take for granted every day, but there's a whole lot that goes into to making that happen. There's a lot of different uh, jobs and, and careers and things available there. Um, there's the wastewater industry. Um, so that's you know what goes down the drain, and then that gets treated, and then goes back into you know, rivers or the or the bay, or what uh, what we're getting ready to do in this area is um, with our wastewater is um, treat it to drinking water quality standards and inject it underground back into the groundwater aquifer. So that's the kind of big changes on the horizon that are that are coming here. Um, and then stormwater, which is basically capturing the runoff from storm events. Um, and then we also have to deal with uh, quantity and quality of that stormwater. So um, we're trying to um, let things settle out of it as much as possible, 
um, slow down kind of the peak rushes of flow to, to help with, with flooding. And so flooding is obviously a major issue in this area. <coughs> a lot to do with our elevation and proximity to water than anything else. And then it goes, goes back into the environment. So um, what I'm going to focus on, this is kind of where my uh, expertise is, is in uh, potable water storage tanks. So many of us um, probably drive by them uh, every day. Um, but we do kind of design of new tanks, um, working on the coating and painting to maintain them. Um, you know, as they age, we have to kind of assess and make sure that we take care of them. Um, and modifications to them, uh, putting in a mixing system I'll talk about later. Um, you know, all of them now have, uh, just about have cell, cellular antennas on there, so we help kind of navigate that process with um, dealing with the uh, cell phone providers and, and things of getting on the tanks without messing up the tanks. And then all the things of there's instrumentation and chemical feed and all kinds of stuff. And then, you know, when they're out of service is, is demoing them. Um, one, if you're familiar with area, you'll see disappearing very soon is the one that's um, right before you cross the Hampton Road Bridge Tunnel. That will be uh, there. They don't need that one anymore, so you'll be seeing that one disappear uh, very soon. But that one's very, very old. I think it's like 100 years old. So tanks come in uh, different shapes and sizes. Um, you said you live in Tyson's Corner. This one might look very familiar <laughs> yes, to you. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, so we, uh, we did the design of, of that one. Um, so some people often wonder why, we, why do we need to put millions of gallons of water and put it way up in the air? Um, but you know, it's basically your, your classic uh, potential energy type, type problem. And you got to pump it to get up there, but if something happens in order to save energy and also for emergencies, um, things like that, where, um, uh, where power is down and there's an issue with the, the plant, you've got a couple days worth of drinking water storage that's up there that can flow by gravity just down to, to the pipe. So that's that's why um, that's why we do that. But they come in all different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they're not elevated, they're just sitting in the ground, um, and there's pumps there to, to keep the pressure up. Um, so just kind of what goes into what, what I do when we want to uh, put in a new tank. So I'm just going to do just a brief overview of things. So you know, we look at where you want to put that, and this is a map that you know, we, we like these things to be uh, up high, just to take advantage of the elevation and the, and, and the gravity. It's the most cost effective to do it that way. So we'll look at sites that are at a certain elevation, uh, and that's a, uh, you know, within the, the service area. And then, I'm not going to go through all these, but basically we, we come up with all these criteria. Some of them are calculations, some of them are just preferences. Um, but there's a whole lot that goes into where you site one of these and so these are just some of the examples of, of, of all the things that we have to uh, consider. This is one of the things we do is, um, this is not an actual thing, it's just a photo rendering. So this was a, a proposed tank site. And so sometimes what they have us do is we'll go to the tank site and we'll, we'll send up a, a big uh, balloon to the height that the tank is going to be. And then like the people who make those decisions, like the planning commissions and the it will, we'll go around and, and look at where that balloon is sitting from various um, vantage points to see you know, what, what the public is going to see when, they, uh, when this tank is actually built and how visible it is from, from all different directions. <coughs> That's one of the things that we do. Uh, this is another pretty cool thing we do is, um, is shatter projections because you, know, you put this big structure up that's going to create shadows. And so where are those going to fall and how is that going to um, affect people? Uh, we really had we had a site be disqualified one time because there was um, uh, you know an, an old lady's garden that needed lots of sun and <laughs> this tank was going to put that garden in the, the shadows and so she complained about it in the public meetings and the right people and so you know it's just one of the you know there's just lots of things that, that go into that that you have to try to consider and so and. Um, so it's just one of the things that we do. <laughs> Ultimately what we do is we provide uh, this is an example of, of construction plans to contractors. And so, you know, let's say Cooper News Waterworks um, you know, wants to build a tank and they hire us to, to design it. We would develop these, 
these plans and then they would put it out for public bid and contractors based on those plans would would bid on that um, <coughs> that job and so that's that's essentially um, what we do on the uh, on the private side so whether it's tanks or pipelines or pump stations or anything like that that's that's essentially what, what we do uh, this is just a brief overview of kind of uh, uh, some research that goes into that um, Disinfection byproducts are something that um, are can be a hot topic, and so what are they? They're, they're compounds formed when chlorine, which you know we use to disinfect the water, reacts with naturally occurring organic matter. All right, and so it forms these these two types of uh, compounds, and these are the ones that are currently regulated. The reason they're regulated is because there is. There's nothing definitive, but there's some evidence to suggest that maybe over a long period of time they could cause health impacts. So it's uh, it's nothing like uh, you know, like lead, for example. You know, lead is horrible, and anytime there's you know, you as we saw in Flint, you know, anytime you see lead limits, it's let's stop everything. I mean, that was horrible what they did in in Flint and. Everyone involved should go to jail, as far as I'm concerned. And just as someone who works in the industry, it just infuriated me to see what how that went down. And not so much that you know sometimes people make mistakes, but that they covered they covered it up. They they just I'll I'll stop talking because I just you know, that, that was a, that was horrible. But these are nowhere, so I just say that because on the relative scale, these are nowhere near that type of, you know, cause for alarm or concern. Um, but there are things that, you know, they do have limits on, and we always need to try to abide by regulation. So, um, so there's a little, little chemistry. Um, but it's basically the hypochlorite reacts with the um, organic matter to form, and forms these chlorinated organics. And so this is a function of these types of things. And what that does is, if they're a function of those, that gives us opportunities for control. So if we can impact any one of these things on the bottom, then we can help help these things. So, um, so there's different ways you can do that through your piping network, um, through chlorination. So if you if you don't want to dump too much chlorine in at the plant, you can let that go, and then you you know it's going to die down over time. So then maybe at points in your system, you can put some more in to, dis to disinfect it. So, um, so that's what you know, that strategic points are. But I'm going to focus on you know, storage tanks, which is kind of my area. But things you can do in storage tanks to help with controlling these things. Um, so there's operational adjustments. And this had everything to do with you know, getting your water from the plant to your tap quicker. We want to shorten that amount of time. And so this uh, particular place was having really high um, levels um, of, uh, of the contaminants. And what we figured out was that the water age was 16 days, um, which, is, which is really high. And so through some operational changes versus you know timing of, of when we pump and when we open certain valves and things like that, just looking at a uh, like a holistic view of the system, uh, we're able to get that down to uh, around seven days average of water age. And just by doing that, we're able to get everything down below where it needs to be. So you know, those are some of the types of things that, that we do. Um, another thing we can do is we, we put mixing systems in, in tanks now. Now, this doesn't actually reduce the concentration of anything, but it just averages the, the um, you know, the concentrations within the tank. And so um, you still need to have water turnover for it to do anything, but what this does is it just makes your tank operation more efficient. So you don't have dead zones in your tank where water is just sitting there aging and, and getting old, and all you're doing is, you know, using this one little corner of the tank as water goes in and out. So you mix it, you equalize all that, and it just makes it more efficient. And this is kind of a... a uh, that, that shows that you know this is a, a model of a tank um, and uh, uh, of temperature, and so as you can see, like with water 
flowing into this tank over time, 2 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, nothing's happening to this whole area up here. So this water is just stagnant. And then it's just, just aging. But if you put in a mixing system, you know, where you run a pipe up this tank and put, you know, inlets and outlets all along it, then you get mixing the whole thing. Yes? So are these actual images or this is this is a model. model. This is a this is a software that, that models um, the, uh, uh, the the temperature based on it. Um, the other thing that, and this is what um, what a colleague worked on was um, was tank aeration, and so um, you just throw a little little math and chemistry stuff there. But basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get these these chemicals out of the water and into the air. Is what we're trying to do. Uh, it works for the uh, the TTHMs because they're volatile. It does not work for um, HAH. So. Um, so what we do is, um, there's different types of aeration methods, um, and some of them we eliminated because they just weren't cost effective, but um, the, the, the best ones are usually the, like the spray type. And so these are just some, what they do is, um, you know, they put these things in here that kind of suck in the water and pump them up and then spray them out in the top of the tank. Because Storage tanks aren't completely full. There's an air gap. There's an air space inside. And so we take advantage of that, if the tank's properly vented, um, to just spray that water. And as it's spraying and interacting with the air, these compounds are, are being released. And they're not harmful to air quality whatsoever. It's, uh, it's in the drinking water. So, um, so we have found these, this to be, uh, to be very effective in, in certain scenarios. Of, uh, of decreasing the concentration. So, um, another thing that um, we can go after is it uh, you know, reacts to organic matter. So, if we have organic matter that's settling out in the tanks, if we keep that clean, then we can eliminate that reaction. And so, um, you're supposed to inspect tanks uh, every three to five years, is kind of the, the guidelines on it. Um, they're looking to make that regulatory to where when utilities get their permits, they have to show that they're inspecting their tanks or that time. Um, and uh, see, there's two ways to do it. You can empty your tank completely and take it offline and clean it out, or you can do it with the tank in service. And so that's what. Um, I do a lot of is working with the guys who use the, the robotics. Um, you can also put a diver in, in a tank um, to, uh, to do the inspection. Um, but uh, that's, there's always a risk when you put someone in a tank. So, um, so we'll talk more about um, some of the emerging technology and robotics and how we use them for, uh, for tanks. Um, so this is kind of one of the ways just yes. attention grabber things is, you know, is in a robot convenient. And uh, so we can play name that robot. Oh, yeah. So you guys remember this one? Johnny Five. Johnny Five. Yeah, <laughs> this guy. Is that this is old school. This is, this is Buck Rogers. That's, yeah. that's TV. And uh, everyone knows R2D2. <laughs> Terminator, this is Optimus Prime, and this guy from, uh, I forgot his name, lost his face. So, yeah. so, um, so here's some ways we use, we use robots. Um, the two primary drivers are obviously safety and cost efficiency. Um, this is an article, it happened last year, that um, there was a, someone diving in a tank and had problems with his oxygen line and they couldn't get him out in time. And so that's really one of the, you know, you know, they're good at what they do, they, they know what they're doing, there's safety protocols in place that follow, but it's always a risk, you know, and so if we can try to eliminate those risks, then that's a good thing. Yeah. So this is um, a video. One of the things we do for the exterior inspections is um, we're starting to use drones, and uh, so this is a really, really old tank, and so, you, you know, if you never want to climb something, you don't have to. Yep. And, uh, okay. 
So you don't know how rickety it is, you don't know the quality. So the drones give you a good idea of what's going on. Now obviously you can't put your hand on it, you can't measure the, uh, the coating thickness, you, you know, you can't tell if that you know, steel is really rusted through or not. But you can get a pretty good picture of what's, what's happening there. So that's, a, that's one of the things we're doing is taking advantage of, of drones to do that. Um, yes. So is that a subcontractor job that you operate the drones that send them, or is it part of your organization? We subcontract that out. Okay. In order to use a drone for, like, there's very little regulation on private drones. Anybody yes. can go do whatever, yes. um, except, you know, there's, there's certain rules about registering with the FAA and not flying in a no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. But most people don't even care to look at where the no-fly zones are until you run into that. But if you're going to fly, if you're going to do it commercially, actually get paid to, you have to be a registered drone pilot with the FAA, okay. and there's there's different um, regulations involved if you're going to do it commercially and get paid to do it. So that's that's much more regulated than you know just somebody doing it rec recreationally. Okay. So, um, and then the internal inspection with these uh, these little guys, um, and they have a. One of the guys we worked with, he actually did a lot of modifications to his. He puts little tools on them and probes on them, so you can uh, do a lot of stuff. I'll uh, show some videos here if you were. This is looking up at a roof of the tank from from inside, so you can get a really good view of what's going on with the rafters. Obviously, there's some corrosion happening there, um, but uh, you basically he, he'll take and swim that thing just in circles around the edge of the tank. It has a, uh, a probe on it that can tell you, to tell you if you have metal loss to measure the metal thickness. It's got a little brush tool on it that will brush things aside. It's got a, uh, a depth gauge on it that uh, will measure like if there's sediment in the bottom, how deep it is. And it, uh, it's got a probe on it that measures like temperature in the different levels of the tank. So, there's a lot of cool uh, technology. This is one that just shows you know, there's a little spot in the tank and used a little brush to clean it and saw that you know, there's actually pitting in the side of the tank. So, um, yeah. so anytime you've got exposed metal, all exposed metal is going to corrode. And that's, a, that's, a bad, that's a bad thing. So, uh, so those are the types of things that, that we're looking for. And, and then we have uh, the RoboVac, which is uh, you, you get settlement, your things settle out into the bottoms of the tanks, and so they want to get those cleaned out. And so there's two ways to do it. You can empty the tank and like manually <laughs> put all that stuff out. Um, you know, or you can you can drop one of these, it's like cleaning your pool. But uh, it's a, uh, and here's some video of how that works. Uh, this is the camera on the front of the thing. So this goes back and forth like uh, like mowing a lawn or something. But, uh, but it takes, it, it sucks all that out and they capture it as it, leaves the tank and they filter out the water and just dispose of the sediment. Uh, this is one, this tank had a lot of sediment in it, but uh, it, uh, it just shows it's able to do it without stirring up all of the dirt and making the water uh, dirty. So, but that shows how that thing is uh, in action. Yes, that's, that's drinking water. Yes, that's drinking water. Now, how far can you clean the How far? Um, some, it, it varies because some people like, um, like there's tanks, I've been in some of the tanks here where you, know, you go five years between cleanings and there's maybe this much in it. Um, it a lot of times it depends on how close it is to the, uh, the treatment plant um, because you're trying to settle out as much as you can at the, at the plant, but it doesn't all settle out at the plant. So then when it gets into these tanks and it's just sitting still, like, you know, more things settle out of it. So, um, and then some people don't do anything with them for years and years and years, and, and you don't know how much is in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hopefully this is a relevant question. At what level is the water withdrawn from the tanks? I would hope it's not towards the bottom. Is it up about 12 feet? It varies. I mean, typically, it's about a foot off the the floor. They have they have sediment they have sediment rings that that go up so that the sediment gets around that, and then the intake pulls down 
then it takes it out of there. So. Oh, you had a question. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so, so the the storage tanks are being inspected for corrosion and everything. What about the pipes, like to from your your uh, water treatment facility plant and then out? There's uh, there's more and more of that going on in terms of managing those assets because we're one of the big things like in really infrastructure in general, but in the, the water infrastructure, is that there, a lot of it's reaching the end of its useful life right now. And so what we're trying to do is, is set up, how do we inspect things in a, in a targeted manner um, versus some, like some uh, municipalities just, they just plan, we're gonna replace this many miles of pipe every single year. And we're not even gonna bother inspecting it. We're just gonna target <coughs> our oldest areas are they targeted by by breaks or complaints? So they they set up maps that you know based on where the complaints are coming in, um, how often they have a water main break and have to repair it, and those those types of things. We're getting ready to do one in the uh, in the city of Norfolk on West Little Creek that uh, the mains were built uh, in like 1910 something like that. So we're getting ready to do this. Yes. I'm just curious about um, the number of hurricanes that have happened recently, what happens in the communities that have their water towers? I mean, are they immediately inspected for viability? Uh, is that water used at all? Because I know there's a, always a mad rush, the Red Cross get bottom water there. I'm just wondering, if what happens with the water towers that have sustained no damage? Are they being used to distribute water or no? What, what happens with those towers? They're all connected to the system. And so if, if the if the treatment plant is up and running, um, and there's a there's a there's a required testing that goes on at points all around the system, so if the water is is meeting the drinkable water criteria, then that water will be flowing, you know, immediately um, from from that. So um, the the problems come in, you know, when. <coughs> You know, if there's certain elements of the treatment process that they don't have backup power for, because sometimes entire treatment plants get get flooded out, and so at that point, you know, after about a day or two, you don't have any more drinkable water in your system, so you can't use it. So you either got so they'll have like you know, get boil notices sometimes that you know you can't drink anything without boiling it, um, that type of thing, and then they're they're trying to get you know bottled water distributed as soon as. Possible. Like I know, uh, just like the city of Norfolk, for example, they have warehouses and warehouses of, of water that they bottle from their plant, and then they have emergency plans in place for distribution centers and, and things like that. So, and I just, whenever what happened with Houston, they they reviewed all those processes to kind of make try to try to be as ready as possible. I mean, sometimes disasters are just unpredictable, but that's that's what they do. And uh, they build storage tanks extremely strong. Like a lot of times, like I notice this just because it's in you know, but you'll see you'll see uh, tornadoes, you know, wipe out areas in the yes. water tank. Is, is still, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, they're uh, they're they're built to to last, and and uh, like the ones around here are built usually on pile foundations um, that go down. Um, you know, 80 feet or so into the ground um, to get down to, you know, good, good solid foundation so they don't go anywhere. That is another, um, and I'll, uh, it's okay, I'm going to breeze through. Um, robot tank climbing. Um, this is kind of new. We're working on ways to use robots to climb the outside of the tank. So this way they can take uh, readings on the outside of the tank and figure out um, what the condition is of the of the coating. Um, another thing that we're working on is um, is using this unit to grind welds. So if they do tank rehab or putting in a new tank and welding up on high surfaces. Um, so this is all kind of in the testing phase right now. So um, I don't know why I flipped on this, but um, so that's that's just shock testing of, of that. So this is something that. Um, is in the testing phase. So we're always looking for more efficient, different ways to, to do things. And 
Uh, the goal is if, if we can do this twice as fast as uh, traditional methods, then you know, it would be extremely marketable and, and uh, be something very worthwhile. Um, so just wrap it up, getting students involved. Um, like I said, I'm on a committee called Work for Water, and part of the K through 12 outreach for that. So one of the things we do is um, we do we do classroom presentations or career fairs. I have some of the display materials over here and some some handouts. So um, you know, so we're available to do um, career fairs or classroom presentations. This is one of the the fifth ways. Um, I guess it didn't play, but it's um. This is like a video that goes through and talks about, it's, it's, this is for younger students, um, that talks about water and the industry. And then we have one geared toward high school students where it's just interviewed with people who are um, interns and in the different career fields in the water industry. Um, so we'll come in and do those. Um, we put on a, a bottle of water tower uh, competition. Uh, this is actually happening this Saturday at, uh, at ODU. Um, and uh, basically, middle school, school school students build functioning water towers. So it's uh, they, you know, when you register, you get the criteria, you build it on your own, um, you bring it in, uh, you bring it to ODU on this day, and they it's a half day. They go through a, a testing and judging um, thing, and then the uh, uh, the best place, best thing for the kids is uh, for seventy five dollars for each team member if they win. 50 a second, so there's, there's cash prizes, and it's a free event, so um, we're, uh, so it's, that's this Saturday, our registration is closed for this year, but if you're interested in, you know, maybe next fall, get students involved, it's something they do on their own, um, it doesn't cost hardly any money, they actually get judged on using, you know, um, salvaged materials, so we don't want them to spend money. We want them to be creative with stuff they can find around the house or this being thrown. Um, uh, junior Water Jam. Every year we have an industry conference that comes to the area, and so for the past two years we invite students um, to come in and um, they talk to the different people in the water field and the profession and uh, ask questions. And then we go through the exhibit hall. And they see different technology and get to engage with people. Um, it's always just tough for um, for public schools in particular because it's in September. So it's really hard to like, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's like the second week of September, so it's nearly impossible <laughs> to get that to get that lined up. There's nothing really we can do about it because it's it's an industry conference and not set up just for students. But uh, but that's we just think we're trying to do to invite invite students. Um, other opportunities, um, internships and, and mentoring. Um, my, my company is always trying to hire uh, interns, and as are other engineering firms in the area. Um, the, uh, the public utilities uh, have internship programs. Um, I also know that the, uh, like the treatment plants and laboratories, like with HRSD, um, you know, people are always excited about having kids in to, to show them what they do. Um, so those are opportunities. Um, and then the Hampton Roads uh, Public Works Academy, which is a uh, you know, different location, is one here. <laughs> but those students um, get engaged in the, uh, you know, in what utilities do, and they place them with internships. So, so those are just some opportunities that are available. Um, so just wrapping up, so I was trying to think about you know, how I define like engineering and um, so the, uh, just thinking back to my school days, is like the multiple choice tests, and it was always like, you know, finding the best answer. And I always hated those, you know, I wanted it to be like the only right answer, but it, it was, uh, but it's not. And that's kind of how engineering is, is, you know, there's lots of right answers out there, but what's the best solution? And so engineering is kind of finding the best solution in a, in a world of right answers. What technology should we apply? What's the most cost effective and for that client. And then you always have the elusive none of the above. What we're really trying to do is find that none of the above answer that no one's thought of before. What is what is that thing? And any, anytime we can encourage students to be creative and innovative and you know what's that, you know, what's the next step, you know, and, and they can be a part of that um, is a, is very motivational. So thanks for your time. Any, any Thank questions? you.